All right, we are going live. Good morning. Good morning, afternoon. Oh, it's afternoon where you are. Yeah, that's right. Got it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's great to be back together uh, in June for Facebook Live. We appreciate our audience that stuck with us in May. We had some technical difficulties, so sorry about that. But we're really yeah. glad to be back. Yes, absolutely. It's great to be here with everyone. Great to be here with you today, Joe. Uh, happy Friday to those of you that are watching this on today because it's Friday. Um, so thank you guys for joining us and gals, but um, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, what? what's on your mind, Joe, before we get started? Well, you know, tomorrow is kind of a significant day. Um, this morning in my devotional online, um, it was mentioned that tomorrow celebrates, uh, it's called Juneteenth, and it's celebrated tomorrow on June 19th. And it's when slavery officially ended in the United States. Um, I say officially, the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was on June 19th, 1865. Mm. But it was two and a half years before the slaves in Texas knew they were free. They didn't learn about that until wow. June 19th. Um, I'm sorry, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863 and they learned about it in 1865, more than two and a half years later. Wow. And so that day is now declared as being Juneteenth. And I'm not sure what the name means specifically, but it was initially, initially only celebrated in Texas, but it's being recognized now across the country. And you know, the slaves were free, but they didn't know it. And it just really reminded me of so many of our friends and those who will become our friends yep. who have been um, caught in trafficking and are unable yeah. to be free uh, for whatever reason. They can't find their way out to freedom, but that they are indeed free because Jesus has made a way. He has yes. made a way for them to be free. And so um, our, our country recognized that God created everyone in his image that we are free to be in his image and that we should not own one another. We should not be um, oppressing and taking away the freedoms and rights of another. So it's kind of a great theme for us to start today um, with our program because we are free. We are free indeed through Jesus yes. Christ. And that's the message of our faith initiatives here on Facebook Live. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, and, and just it is, it's a great, I'm, I am glad that we've made it an actual federal holiday because I think it's a great, if there's going to be something we need to celebrate as a nation, yes. that's it. Um, I live in South Carolina now. And when, when I came to visit South Carolina to like, we were kind of spying out the land, making sure this is where we felt like God really wanted us. Um, I, I felt like as we were here, my son Jacob and I were driving around Charleston and I felt like he said, you know, one of the things he wants to do is um, in the place that created one of the greatest divisions in our nation, he wanted to release a great healing and unity across our nation. And that was that was super big to me. Um, and, you know, South Carolina was the first state to secede. They uh, the war started. Civil war started in South Carolina. And so for me, that's a really big deal. I, I love um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we get to celebrate that tomorrow. So that's, that's exciting. That um, is awesome. That's yeah. wonderful. I know that, um, you know, Charleston, South Carolina had a massive, uh, revival and reformation, uh, a hundred and some, uh, years ago, about a hundred yep. years ago, uh, yep. where people's lives were changed through prayer. And, you yes. know, on Facebook live, we, we, we always end our program with prayer because we know that yeah. that's how things change. And, yes. and even in our culture today, there's so many things that concern us and, and that, that make our hearts hurt and ache for others. And it's going to be through prayer that we win that battle. So um, I'm yes. super excited to be here with our audience and to just at the end of this program, uh, be able to just share a time of prayer where we Absolutely. can unburden our hearts and lift those 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 burdens off and cast them on someone who's much greater than we are yes. we can actually do something about it yep absolutely yeah so um we're just about ready to start as you can see our little timer there counting down um we're just about ready to jump into the meat of our show so um i guess we might as well just go ahead and and get started 
Um, yeah, absolutely, Chris. Uh, Chris Martinez says there is power in prayer, and I can yes. agree more. So, um, like we always do, part of our purpose here is to equip you guys not only just praying for those who are uh, victims of trafficking, but to give you tools to help you fight this yes. battle. So uh, today I'm, I'm like, I'm really grateful for passionate people. Um, uh, I'll skip that. I'll let you go because I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's so tempting. We want to start talking about the program and then we, we really tell do. about the program. Spoiler really alert, Richard, yeah. good catch. Good yeah, catch. I almost, I almost, yeah. <laughs> Well, let me just reiterate, um, Faith Initiatives has a, a mission statement, and I just want to say that right up front. We engage individuals nationwide who are seeking a biblical perspective to educate and empower them on what is domestic minor sex trafficking, and then to give them the tools to train their churches and communities so they can protect kids. So that's really kind of what we're all about. And that's what our, our host is, I mean, our guest is today. Uh, we're hosting Dr. Christine Harmon. And as we review the eye care materials, which you can see right over my shoulder there, uh, they include printed guides, films, and an online course. And they are great materials to help you you, share with your healthcare providers what signs to look for and how to become a part of the pathway to freedom uh, for victims of trafficking. So that's what we're all about today. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like really important for you to know that even though many of you who are watching or will be watching this may not be healthcare providers, first responders, it doesn't matter. Um, number one, the content is appropriate to like we're, you're going to hear it over and over again. Just share it with your healthcare providers, um, and and anyway, so it's it's exciting. But you know, doctors, nurses, emergency room staff, EMTs, first responders, school nurses, all will benefit from this material. Um, it's written so that anyone um, on a team that's working medically to care for minors who have been trafficked would benefit from this content. Yes. And this week I was talking to one of my regional coordinators for ambassadors in um, Colorado, and she was mentioning the four um, eye care training films. Uh, she said they are full of red flags that that a healthcare provider can look for. And she's director of nursing at the University of Denver. So she was just extolling the virtues of this program yeah. and saying how often uh, victims are overlooked simply because the medical staff either didn't know what to look for or didn't know what questions to ask. So I'm super excited about today's program. <laughs> Another thing that the materials will help with um, is how to approach this subject with patients in a way that's not judgmental. Mm -hmm. uh, victims of trafficking already have, you know, they've, they've been abused, um, they've been demeaned, um, a lot of times they're, they're re-traumatized by things we don't even realize we're doing, um, even, even alienated by our body language and, and just plain mm -hmm. bad bed manner. Um, yeah. and, and so this material is going to help teach people how to interact with them. Boy, those are such good points. Non-judgmental. We can all participate in that attitude, cleaning up our body language, our words, the, the way we look and act when we see someone who may be involved in this, a kid on the street or in the mall or, or someone who's dressed what we deem is inappropriate and maybe yeah. even dangerous. Um, God loves them right where yes. they're at. And yes. he wants us to treat them with respect and see them as they will be on the other side, holding their victor's crown and saying, I made it, I'm here, I'm a child of the king. And so that's our Absolutely. goal. Well, I can't wait to introduce our, our guest, Dr. Harmon, and find out more from her as part of the review team for these materials. Yeah, absolutely. We might as well just go ahead and jump into your interview. And so let's just do it. <laughs> Today we're hosting Dr. Christine Harmon, but before she comes on camera, let me just tell you a little bit about her. She has had a long medical career working first in pediatric adolescent medicine as a physician's assistant, then receiving her MD degree from the University of Colorado and completing family medicine residency at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. 
She practiced family and urgent care medicine for over 30 years in Tacoma, Washington, with an emphasis on pediatric adolescent medicine, women's health, and mental health. She's enjoyed teaching, teaching and mentoring many young doctors, PAs, and ARNPs. She's currently a medical consultant to the Social Security Administration. Dr. Harmon and I both began training and volunteering with Shared Hope about the same time in uh, 2010. So Dr. Harmon, welcome. We're so happy to have you on our show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, you know, I have to say that I love the fact that in you and Richard, Shared Hope has two pastors on full-time staff. Oh, That's very cool. Well, thank you. It's an honor to serve in this capacity as the Director of Faith Initiatives. Richard and I really enjoy hosting our guests to help our audience understand more about what child and youth sex trafficking is and how mm -hmm. they can be effective in preventing it. Not only preventing it, but so they know the signs of trafficking when they see it, perhaps right there in front of them, they'll know how to effectively respond. Do you remember, Dr. Harmon, the first time you became aware of DMST? Uh, yes, I, I actually do. Um, it, it was back in 2010. And to kind of set the stage, I'll say that I was pretty much like, most Americans, including colleagues with whom I've spoken about this topic, in that I was aware that young women were often brought into the United States as so-called mail order brides, or specifically to work in prostitution. But in 2010, I came across and read a book called Half the Sky. And husband, dual Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, Cheryl Wudun and Nicholas Kristof. And through reading that book, I became aware of the huge scope of human trafficking mm. and especially sex trafficking throughout the world. So the next thing that happened was that Linda Smith, who is, as you know, the founder and CEO of Shared Hope International, actually came to my church to conduct a seminar as part of a uh, convention having to do with um, human trafficking. And as I listened to Linda, I, I was just stunned to realize that um, sex trafficking of American children and teenagers is taking place right here in America. And I just felt like scales dropped from my eyes and I talked to Linda and um, began volunteering with Shared Hope very shortly thereafter. Kind of what we say, the rest is history. Um, when I yes. first met you in 2013, we were on the Terry's House Project and my husband, Nick, had just begun serving on Shared Hope's Board of Directors. And then you came on the board in 2015 and now you're the chairman of the board for almost 13, uh, three years. So it appears that you and I have kind of a similar story Meeting Linda Smith changed our life. Uh, you probably have heard my story. I read the Renting Lacey book. And then, of course, my husband thoroughly researched Shared Hope's financial responsibilities and then was convinced <laughs> that we would work with Shared Hope. So uh, that's our story. Uh, what about Shared Hope made you personally want to join the team? Well, you know, again, I was, I was stunned by the knowledge I had just acquired, and I just felt that um, as, as a physician, um, I needed to somehow participate in the fight against yeah. what is really a, an American travesty. Yeah. Yeah. So you were personally impacted as a doctor. You also have children and now you have grandchildren. We've talked about that, that a true. lot. So That's you're true. even more heavily invested today in keeping children safe. Oh, um, I absolutely. know that while you were while you were working in urgent care, uh, you enjoyed mentoring young doctors, physical assistant, uh, physicians assistants, and advanced registered nurse practitioners. I had to look up what A R N P <laughs> was. I'm sure that is uh, what connected you to Shared Hope's project to produce the guide for RNs and MDs to help review it, uh, recognize the signs of trafficking when someone is presented in front of a medical practitioner. 
-hmm. As a reviewer for that guide, what were you specifically looking for it to accomplish and what did you find? Mm. Well, you know, this the project was really exciting to me <laughs> because it was so needed. I had sort of been mentioning around shared hope that we needed to have some education for medical <laughs> providers. So this is really exciting. Um, it, uh, I, you know, as a doctor, I just knew that most of my colleagues would have no idea how to spot a victim, a victim of juvenile sex trafficking, let alone know what to do about um, mm. such a situation. So as I started to review it, I realized it was a really powerful tool for, for a few reasons. Um, first of all, it actually explains just what domestic minor sex trafficking mm. is in the United States, yeah. what, it, what it looks like. Um, it outlines who the people are that actually sex traffic these kids and how they're sex trafficked. It talks about the fact that traffickers can be what a lot of Americans would consider to be a standard quote unquote pimp. It can be a gang or, um, or a gang member. Um, it can be a, a, tragically a family member or a family system that traffics these kids. So as I, as I got into reviewing it, I realized that it, it does some specific things. First of all, it, it gives providers a context within which to work. And that's what I was just referring to in terms of describing um, some of the particulars about juvenile sex trafficking. Uh, the tool also does give us some clues to watch for, and I know um, that we'll be discussing that more a little later in, in the interview, in the program. But the other thing it does is give providers clarity about our roles. So our job is to come to suspect that our patient is a victim of juvenile sex tra trafficking and to manage those suspicions within the context of what's come to be called trauma-informed care. Um, it is emphasized in the tool that we have to do this within an environment and in a manner that is safe for all concerned and preferably in a situation where there are services that can be provided either within our own medical systems or in the community to help these victims of juvenile sex trafficking, sometimes even while they're, they're still being trafficked, but certainly um, if, if they should decide to as, escape from this. So it, it really um, gives us the opportunity to understand the situation, come to understand um, our, our own role, and um, provides us with clues that, uh, that we can use to effect this suspicion. Yeah, wow, that's powerful. I know our audience uh, may not be medical professionals. You may just be church people. You may be someone who just found out about this uh, Facebook Live and you wanted to join us. So um, as we're describing, and, and Dr. Harmon is so ably describing this tool, we are going to talk about what some of those signs are because you may see them as well as just a person on the street, an advocate, a caring adult who notices something. And so uh, the guide is to help licensed medical professionals recognize the signs should they come in contact with a patient uh, in their care. Like she said, either is being trafficked and wants out or is in danger of being trafficked. Maybe they're just in the early stages or maybe they have gotten out, but they have don't have a clue what happened to them. So, Dr. Harmon, what are some of the initial signs that a medical professional will be able to discover and then begin to help manage? Okay. Well, to, to make this very clear to medical professionals, what I want to do is to say that the suspicion that a young patient is a victim of sex trafficking actually emerges and evolves as we go through our standard methodology of evaluating a patient. So I want to draw an analogy here, and I, I want to say first that 
with this analogy, I am in no way wanting to minimize the gravity of mm -hmm. the patient situation or our responsibility in the situation. But I think an analogy, a quick analogy can help siphon off some of the the fear of the, of the daunting task before us if we're going to do this. So say, for example, a patient walks into an emergency room, slightly bent at the waist, holding on to the lower part of their abdomen and slumps into the chair before the receptionist. We've all seen this and says, my stomach, unquote, has been hurting for three days and it's getting worse. So what we as medical professionals do is to go through a very standard sequence of events. And hopefully about two hours later, we'll have an assessment of what is causing that abdominal pain and be able to do something about it in one way or another. So the same thing happens here. With our patient, the the nursing staff has given us a chief complaint. We look at what that complaint is, whether it has to do with trauma or anything else. And the first thing to do is to actually look at the medical record, review the medical record. So with the with a victim, a juvenile, a victim of juvenile sex trafficking, what we may see is we may see um, a history of multiple episodes of trauma of substance abuse, overdose, mm -hmm. suicidal ideation and or attempts, recurrent episodes of STDs, one or more abortions in teenage girls, anogenital trauma. We may also see evidence of high risk to be trafficked, which would include things such as having a history of being mm -hmm. abused in childhood and also perhaps identifying as an LBGTQ youth. So after we've had a chance to review the medical record, we go in to see the patient. And the first thing we assess is general appearance. For medical professionals, that's capital G, capital A, <laughs> general appearance. And these patients will initially for lack of a better way to describe it, appears though something is really wrong. They may look depressed, anxious, drugged, somber, with their eyes really downcast, the hoodie pulled over, or they may look anxious and hypervigilant with their eyes darting around the room. They're generally reluctant to speak to us, they are typically accompanied by an adult who claims to be somebody significant in their life, who is actually the trafficker, but claims to be somebody such as a father, a boyfriend, or even a mother. This person controls the interview and holds on to the patient's phone throughout the visit to prevent the patient from texting anybody, including us. So after we've had a chance to assess the general appearance, we move on to the physical exam. These patients may have signs of old trauma, new trauma. They may be malnourished as evidenced not only by their general appearance, but a very low BMI and often changes in hair. Their oral health may be very poor, both from neglect as well as sometimes um, drug use. Tattoos tend to be plentiful, and specifically, uh, we may be able to identify a tattoo that we suspect could be um, a mark of ownership by the trafficker. These tattoos tend to be placed typically at the nape of the neck or just above the intergluteal cleft on the low back. So the the most obvious thing that we would look for of course would be uh, signs and symptoms of stds the lab results may be positive for these and the drug screen may be positive for things such as opioids amphetamines etc mm -hmm. let me interject a question about something you said earlier about the control of the trafficker when they're in the room how important yes. is it 
to get this person alone with their medical staff? Um, and is that impossible to do or how would you do that? Is, is that an important part of being able to treat them and speak to them privately? Oh, absolutely it is. It is definitely something that a medical professional who is educated about this phenomenon and wants to have a chance of positively impacting the situation um, will want to do. Um, and there, there are a couple of techniques that can be used very naturally. Um, for example, um, a urinalysis can be ordered. And in that situation, the patient can be taken from the room to the restroom by a nurse who understands the situation and may have a chance to talk privately with the patient. X-rays can be ordered. Um, a place within the emergency room can be set aside where blood can be drawn and the patient can be taken there. It is, of course, important to ensure that wherever the patient is taken, there is complete privacy between the accompanying nurse and the patient in order to increase the chances that mm -hmm. the youth will actually talk with the nurse. And it, right. it does need to be a nurse. It would, be, it would seem very abnormal <laughs> to an astute trafficker for me to lead the patient to x-ray or something that that would that would be a yeah. that would be a red flag yeah so this is a team effort what i'm hearing you say is how important it is that the trafficker cannot hear that conversation when it's being spoken privately between that nurse and the suspected victim that's yes good. that's true but also so that i mean the uh the patient will will say nothing if there's any other person within earshot mm other than that nurse they yeah just won't that's good yeah they're, they're too yeah. they're too afraid they're too sure. scared. yes yeah yeah well i'm i'm so glad just to hear this from a doctor's perspective and uh, for those listening uh if you're not a doctor you're not a nurse you may know someone who is you may have a friend a relative someone you know or we all have doctors and so when we're with our, our MD, uh, you know, even if it's just your annual exam, uh, take the opportunity to talk to them about this. Tell them what you do. You know, I'm concerned about child sex trafficking. I'm part of uh, Shared Hope's listening ear on the ground. I'm just a, a normal citizen, but I'm concerned that our medical professionals do know what trafficking looks like. And then ask, you know, do you know the signs of trafficking? Because I have a wonderful tool that was certified for continuing education credits by Shared Hope, I'd love to share it with you. And just to try to open that door, would, a, would an MD be open to that kind of conversation? Is there a better way to say that? We never want to come off as, I know something you don't know, no. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think the way you've stated it um, is, is really um, perfect. Um, it's it's very hard to capture the the ear of a doctor in that way um, uh, in the in the midst of a very uh, busy day, but yeah. um, I think going into the patient visit with that on your mind and trying to plan to say something even in response to a question that the doctor may ask you about your own health <laughs> is, a, <laughs> is a good door <laughs> to use to, to open the conversation. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm yeah. having headaches, but I'm really concerned about victims of trafficking. Can I tell you? <laughs> Just like we'll this. find a way, find a way. Right, so let me right. ask you this. We've been talking about some physical signs and some uh, kind of obvious things that a doctor might look for. Um, what kind of psychological signs would they perhaps watch for to help identify this victim? Um, what would you see as part of, you know, what's part of that person's makeup? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this tool, of course, has an entire section having to do with this topic. And um, I was a reviewer for the medical part, mm -hmm. not right. this particular section. However, I'll say that this section is really well done and it's very enlightening. Um, victims of sex trafficking suffer from what's called 
complex trauma and a specific kind of complex trauma. So um, I, I always quote a woman named Becca Johnson, who is a PhD psychologist who has had extensive experience treating survivors of sex trafficking. And she, uh, she actually is quoted in, in the tool. And yeah. she says that this type of complex trauma is PTSD on, on steroids. And that's a, that's a good thumbnail sketch way of thinking about it. Cause I think most Americans have some idea of what PTSD is. Mm -hmm. So manifestations that we may see actually within a patient encounter that are features of this kind of complex trauma include things like emotional lability, anger outbursts, irritability, anxiety, hypervigilance, um, sexualization in dress, manner, and speech, depression with or without suicidal ideation. Um, the youth will appear to be loyal and subservient to the adult with them who will be their trafficker. This is out of fear, so they, while they are deferent to the trafficker, they may appear also fearful of that person. Um, or quite the opposite, they may act quite attached. They may have a form of Stock Stockholm Syndrome with this person, right? So another thing that's very important in the medical encounter is that this trafficked child or teenager will have a lot of mistrust of medical professionals. And that's because we as adults are analogous to the adults in their lives who mm. are supposed to have been protecting them, but instead have been or are exploiting them and abusing them. So this can manifest as either complete disengagement lack of engagement from the medical professionals or on the other extreme or in combination anger outbursts toward the medical professionals and it's very important when these things happen that the professional not take this personally that we not see it as just bad behavior that's part of being an unruly teenager but instead, <laughs> that these extremes are really part of complex trauma mm -hmm. and that they therefore are another clue that we can use that, that this child or teenager may be a victim of sex trafficking. Wow, that's all such good information. And you mentioned Dr. Becca Johnson. She's a friend of mine. I've known Dr. Becca for quite a long time. And mm -hmm. right here, I just want to give a new plug for a book that she just released. It's called Leaving the Life, Embracing Freedom from Exploitation. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. co-wrote this book with a survivor of familial trafficking. You mentioned when families betray their own child and sell them into mm -hmm. trafficking. And the proceeds of this book are dedicated to towards providing care and information and support for survivors. So I'm going to take a, a gander here, see if I can get my, that's what the book looks like on the front. That so, is fabulous. Yes. It's that's brand new. I bought it. I read it in like one sitting. I mean, it's one that you just can't put down. And Dr. Becca gives many, many pages of uh, symptoms and signs mm. and interactions, emotional interactions, mm. and then how to help and support that person. It's an invaluable book. So thank you for bringing her up. That was, I didn't plan on that, but you're welcome, <laughs> Dr. Becca. No, it's wonderful. And that, oh, that sounds like an amazing book. I can't wait to get my copy. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good one. And one thing I found in, in it was that the information also is somewhat uh, ability to build a bridge for victims of domestic violence as well. There's mm, such a close tie. Excellent. Excellent. You mentioned Stockholm Syndrome, and sometimes a, a victim who's a victim of violence, they begin to see their trafficker, their, their perpetrator, as it's safer to stay with them than to mm. leave. And, and so they do show that affection or they think they're in love with mm. that person. And boy, mm. we see that in domestic violence. So thank mm. you. Thank you for that segue. That was wonderful. Um, well, you're welcome. I'm sure 
<laughs> I'm sure those in our audience have found this very interesting uh, to know that Shared Hope has a guide for medical professionals that supports them in their practice to recognize the victims of child sex trafficking, and then to know what an effective response is and how to ensure to do what they can to care for them. So let me just take a moment here and tell our audience how you can find this guide um, to either share with a, a physician, a nurse, uh, even EMTs. There's a whole training on our Shared Hope training website for EMTs as well. Um, there are two ways you can access th this information. Go to sharedhope.org slash store. You'll find it also in the little bar at the top of our website, and Richard will include it in the uh, comments here uh, for this broadcast. But you scroll down to the section of training guides and video series, and there are two options. You can purchase the printed guide that Dr. Harmon was part of uh, uh, reviewing, and that has a link in it to the accompanying films. Or you can keep scrolling in the store and go down to our online training center courses, and you can sign up for the EMT, RN, or MD course. And by purchasing that online course, which is interactive, it has the films and has questions and answers. Has It's just a great, great course. I've taken all of them, although I'm sure much of the MD one went right over my head. But it was interesting, and I did learn <laughs> some things. But when you take the courses, you also get an automatic PDF of the printed guide when you complete the course. So you can then print it, put it in a notebook, and you have the same guide that you would have purchased um, for a little further up in the store. So there's two ways to do that right now. The um, RN portion of the um, online course is being reviewed for re, um, what's the word I want? Recertification. That's a certification that needs to be continually renewed. And uh, the certification as well for MDs is constantly reviewed and renewed as required so that you can get your continuing education um, credits. Dr. Harmon, before we end this portion of our program, and then Pastor Richard and I are going to pray with our audience, and we'll be praying for doctors just like you, uh, what would you like to say to those who may be listening to just encourage them about learning the signs of trafficking and the tools that we've discussed today? And the tools. Well, I think the main message really to everyone, but especially to medical people, RNs, MDs, PAs, ARNPs, is that you really can make a difference. One thing that occurred to me as you were talking about this tool just now, Joe, is that an interesting technique to use to educate your own doctor might be to have a copy of the printed manual, which again, of course, can be ordered off the Shared Hope website. And you could just leave it as you leave the room. And it would be discovered by somebody. It would probably be discovered by the nurse who would be, quote unquote, turning over the room, getting it ready for the next patient. Okay. But that would be a good way to get that manual in, uh, into your own doctor's office. So I just thought I would interject that. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Kind of, kind of sneaky, but could be <laughs> That's very, right. very effective. And um, anyway, um, getting back to the question you asked me about um, encouraging people, I, you really can make a difference. Um, Again, our job is to suspect and to know what to do, how to manage those suspicions. Um, it's important to realize that, and I think, I think a lot of medical people when they approach this topic have the idea that they're going to be able to figure out that a young person is sex trafficked and be able to confront that child or teenager and sort of rescue them on the spot. Mm. But that isn't really what happens. In fact, attempting to do that could be very dangerous for the youth and the provider. Instead, what we need to do is to treat that patient in the context of trauma-informed care, trying to build a trust, a little inkling of trust between that patient and yourself so that as time goes on, if that victim 
has further similar encounters with medical people, they may be able to trust enough to find a way to actually escape. So we're part, we're part of stepping stones. We're part of building blocks. Um, one person who is quoted in the tool is a woman named Jen Spry, and she is an RN. And she, she's a survivor of juvenile sex trafficking. And she, like other survivors, will say often that a medical person understanding their plight as her plight was as a 10-year-old girl being sex trafficked, going to a doctor, for a medical person in that setting to understand what was going on with her could have led eventually to her rescue. So that's, that's what we want to think about. So yeah. this, this tool can educate us as medical providers, can take us along the journey of being able to have this kind of impact. And I would also encourage people undertaking this education to try to partner with at least one other colleague who is doing the same, because these situations are really complex. And I think we can do our best work for these victims if we have the support of a colleague, um, another doctor, a nurse, a PA, some other colleague who is also going along this educational journey with the goal of becoming this kind of a building block. Um, we can do our best work if we have the support from another person. So That's really good. That's really good. You know, something as you were talking came to my mind. You were talking about building just a tiny piece of trust. And then perhaps the next time they're with a medical professional, that trust will have made a way for them to maybe have more trust or even open up and disclose and get the help that they need. And it just reminds me of the scripture that talks about that we as workers together with Christ, that we will plant a seed. We may not be the one to harvest. Someone else may water it. But eventually right. someone will harvest it. And I remember right. thinking right. of that as a, as a pastor, you know, we, we often feel so responsible for people's uh, eternal well-being, you know. Mm -hmm. And I began to realize that I could simply be loving and non-judgmental and caring. And then when they came into contact with that spirit, again, that same mm -hmm. feeling they got, they would be a little more comfortable with it. And then someday someone's going to actually invite them to to make a decision and to, mm -hmm. you know, commit to something. And mm -hmm. they're going to feel so comfortable at that point. It's recognizable. It's familiar to them and they'll open up to it. So I just pray the same for medical professionals who use this tool. Well, mm -hmm. so there I you think have that's it. A, a per that's a perfect analogy, Joe. I, I like that very much. That's a really, really good way to think about this process. Thanks. You know, the scriptures just, they, they're living and they, they're not, they never come back void. You know, we take the scripture and we cast it out there and God always honors his word. So yeah, it's blessed me and I'm glad, I'm glad it uh, rang with you too. Um, if you're not a licensed medical professional, our audience, you can still learn from these trainings and you can share it. You heard Dr. Harmon say, if there's an opportunity to just leave it in the exam room as you leave, um, you know, there are different ways. If you, if you want more ways, why don't you email me, joe, J-O at sharedhope.org. We have little cards that tell about this tool, postcards that you could actually leave laying around. Um, there's lots of different ways that we could do this together. So reach out to me and be happy to send you some information. We want to educate our medical professionals to have this kind of impact. And the only way they can do that is if they're educated on what it looks like and how they can have an impact as a doctor or a nurse, or even as an EMT. I keep mentioning that, that training. Um, I took that training uh, two years ago and it was so impactful to me mm. uh, just to understand how a, a fireman or a ambulance driver or a paramedic may mm -hmm. be in a situation more commonly than an MD or an RN. 
and be able to see things that would then give them the clues they need to further investigation into that situation or that person. Um, it was a powerful tool and it impacted me. I spoke to our local EMTs here in Mesa, Arizona about it. And they were like, really, we need that training. So <laughs> I followed up with them. So oh, we just want to say yay. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Thanks for this great information. It was just wonderful to have you with us today. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. I, I feel really honored and very appreciative uh, that you are um, doing this program and educating more and more people about uh, juvenile sex trafficking in general, but in particular about a medical approach to the problem. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And audience, stay with us. Richard's going to be right back and we're going to pray together before we close the broadcast. Thank you, Christine. You are so welcome. Bye, Joe. Hey, that was really great. Wow. Thank you for having that time with her, Joe. That was just a great conversation. Um, and Chris Martinez, yes, uh, God is amazing the way he brings us together and just connects the body of Christ. And it's, it's awesome. And it, it does. It takes teamwork. So thanks for that comment, Chris. And um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I love when we have people like Dr. Harmon, she is, she's really passionate, obviously. Um, I know I've only had, I've had less time with her than you have, Joe, but she's very passionate about this and, and her love for God and for people mm -hmm. always comes out. And, and it's just, it's what we, again, it goes back to what you were saying, Chris Martinez. Um, we need those people. We need people doing that. Um, and so that's what it's going to take. It's like, just like Chris Martinez said, it's going to take that teamwork. It's going to, it's going to take that work as all of us together as believers, uh, to reach out to those that are trying to get out of darkness to, to do our part. Each of us can, can do something. Each of us has a part to play in this. And so, uh, it's just, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the true love of God is always a beautiful expression of acceptance in the way that Jesus revealed himself to the world that he encountered in his day. And uh, my husband and I have been watching the TV series called Chosen, which is the life of Christ. And I was really struck mm. that the first person that Jesus revealed that he was the Messiah was to the Samaritan woman. And it struck me, this was the one who had had five husbands and the man you're living with, yeah. uh, you're not married to. Jesus revealed that to her and, mm -hmm. and she was um, uh, taken by the fact that he knew all about her because she was yep. at the well in the middle of the day to avoid anyone knowing who she was. And isn't it amazing uh, that he would reveal himself first to a woman whose reputation was in question? You'd think Jesus would have gone to an influential person who could help bolster his cause. Right, right. But instead, he went there. He started. And that's the first person outside of the disciples that he revealed that's, himself to. That really struck me. It was amazing. Yeah, great series, by the way. Best best yeah. Jesus. My, my favorite Jesus show ever. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. I'm glad that um, this, this program is uh, having an impact on you. Really appreciate you being here and watching with us. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I guess... <laughs> I guess I never realized that either um, she was the first person, as you were just talking about that first person mm -hmm. outside of the disciples for him mm -hmm. to say who he was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it really reflects a light on the heart of God and how he is yeah. for every single person. Mm -hmm. So um, as we get ready to go to prayer today, we want to invite all of you who are watching right now or will be watching um, you know, to join us in this same attitude, the same heart of God, the same heart that Jesus had. Uh, let's pray for every single person who will come into medical care, that mm -hmm. they will find an accepting and loving person yeah. to help yeah. them. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start this off, Joe, and then, you know, obviously you'll yeah. join in and um, we're going to pray for doctors and nurses um, in every medical situation, you know, Joe talked about the EMT training. So our first responders, we just want to bathe them 
in prayer and those that need to come to them as well. So um, yeah. let's just go ahead and pray. Let's do it. Holy Spirit, I, I just invite you right now in, in this moment, in this time. We need your your guidance, your wisdom, and, and more than anything, you are the comforter. And so I pray that you would go out as the spirit of wisdom, as the as the comforter, and and go and touch the hearts of, of our doctors, our nurses, our first responders. Go, Holy Spirit, go before them. Be wisdom for them in areas they don't know, God, where they are not aware of of what's going on. I ask that you would be wisdom to them and set up divine encounters so that they can come across this training, so that they can come across the, the, the things they need to know to identify victims of trafficking. I pray, Lord, that you would intervene on behalf of, of our precious children, boys, girls, women, that you would go before them as well, that when they encounter medical providers, that the that, that Jesus heart of compassion, just like he had for the Samaritan woman, they would encounter that heart, that love, Lord. I just pray right now for that in Jesus' name. Yes, yes, yes. And Lord, we just lift up our audience that as they have heard and been inspired and interacted with us and those who will listen uh, to this broadcast in the future, that their hearts will be stirred and that they'll begin to see ways and places they can carry this information to others who could utilize it in their professional practices, in the work that they do where they might encounter a victim of trafficking. Lord, I pray especially for school nurses. Um, They are the ones on the front line seeing these kids of all ages um, in all situations. Lord, we know that school nurses and counselors and teachers are the ones who most often report sex abuse and child abuse. And we just pray that they would get this information into their hands so they also can identify domestic minor sex trafficking, that they can help these children and youth. Lord, I just pray that your heart of love that is within those who, most often those who choose this profession, choose it because of compassion and that your heart would be in them to know how to reach out, words to say, um, ways to embrace this person, even if they're not willing to even be touched hugged, but to embrace them with their face, embrace them with their words, embrace them with their body language. Lord, we do pray for um, those who are out in the field on the front lines Mm -hmm. and that our audience that would hear this message would find ways to be able to reach them with these tools. And we ask that in your mighty name. And we believe, like we started the program today, the slaves have been emancipated by the blood of Jesus. We are in his image. We are free, but so many don't know they're free. So Lord, we ask that you carry this message to them in your spirit by this prayer Mm -hmm. that victims of trafficking who feel like there's no way out would begin to see a light shined on their path. Help us to be Mm -hmm. the ones to to walk beside them into their freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Daddy, I just... I just thank you right now that um, you have such an amazing love for every single person Mm -hmm. that walks on this planet because each one of us is an image bearer of God. Each one of us has been created in the likeness of the creator of the universe. And so God, I just ask that you would um, just right now, every person who's watching now or will watch later, Fill us yes. with that love so that we would see every single person with the eyes that you see them with. Help us to see people with the heart you have for them. Help us to respond and react in a way that is just full of love. And I just thank you, God, for yes. personally, for the love that you have for us, Dad. It's only because of that love and and how much we know we've been released from and forgiven from that because we've been loved so much, we can love the same way. So, Father, please 
stir that up in all of us as as we you know get ready to walk away from this time that we would remember your love it's your love it's all about your love you are love and help us to reflect that love we just thank you god for this time of prayer right now lord we just thank you for that in jesus name amen amen Amen. Amen. That was wonderful. I know we could keep praying. Sure, um, good. I'm, this topic is particularly close to my heart. I have many, many family members who are in the medical profession and friends as well. And uh, I've sent the link out to all of them. So if you're watching, thank you. This information <laughs> is for you. You're close to my heart. I also want to tell our audience, uh, you heard us talk to, to Dr. Harmon about the uh, card that they can get uh, by emailing me. This is a postcard that describes the tool we've been discussing. Hold it right up here so you can see it. And if you will email me at joe, J-O at sharedhope.org, we will gladly send you some of those postcards that you can then yeah. uh, leave on the table in the uh, room when you leave an examining room for that nurse to find and always bathe it in prayer. Say, God, help them find this and do something with it. Absolutely. So um, next week, I just want to say, uh, I want to remind you to join us Friday the 25th at the same time right here on Facebook Live yep. as we review the tools for counselors and social workers. Pastor yeah. Richard and I will be right here and our guest is Nancy Winston, who's on staff with Shared Hope International and who holds a master's degree in social work. You've heard me talk about her before, and I know that you're going to be really interested in this. So many churches and those in our audience may be in a position as lay counselors. Yeah. And the, the intervene tool that we'll be talking to Nancy about is a powerful tool yeah. and also has another level for profo professional licensed clinicians. So mm -hmm. it's an amazing um, tool and we'll be talking about that next week right here. We'll Absolutely. be sending a link out to the uh, Faith Initiatives email list. Uh, so you can join us on that program. And remember, if you have friends that you would like to invite to be sure and go to our Faith in Action link uh, on our page, and Richard's adding that link in there. And <laughs> when they sign up, they'll get one of our booklets out of the Faith in Action kit. They can choose uh, men, women, and youth. They can pick the book of their choice and they'll get a PDF of that book uh, free of charge just for signing up to join us. So we hope you'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Lisa, uh, Lisa Jameson, just so I don't uh, miss what you're asking for, you, you asked to put the link in there. Um, is that, just put that in the comments, which link specifically you're looking for so I can make sure you get that. Um, and we'll make sure you walk away with that. But yeah, there's the, let me put that. So right there, that, that sharedhope.org forward slash faith in action. That's where you can go and have your friends or you sign up. And once you do, you get one of those beautiful guides that Joe was just holding up. Um, and it's our free gift to you. And then you'll be notified when we're having our lives. There you go. Email Joe. That's it, Lisa. Yep. Um, so so just... that email that Lisa is wanting, what she's asking for, is this eye care postcard that she can leave on the um uh, on the counter there in the doctor's office exam room so that the nurse can find it. So if you want that same card, please uh, send me an email. I'll get that out to you in the mail. I'll send you two of them so you can share with a friend. And next time yep. you have a reason to be with your healthcare professional, you can leave that card for them. Also encourage you to leave it with your school nurse. Great resource for school yeah. nurses. Yeah. So there you go, uh, Lisa. There's the, the Joe's email there um, as a link. So you can, well, it's not a link, but you can grab that and copy and paste it into your email. Uh, you're welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, again, just so much content in here. Uh, Dr. Harmon was amazing. Joe, you guys had a great conversation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank um, you. We just really appreciate you guys being a part of this. And again, invite you to continue to be a part of it um, by signing up on our Faith in Action yes. page um, and, and just joining us you know, every couple times a month as we do this because we want to equip you with ways to put your faith into action. So 
thank you. God bless you. We really just pray for you and yes. pray that you would be blessed today with all the love and mercy and grace that God has for you. Uh, so thank you again. God bless you. And um, share that email out with your family and friends. And that's it. That's, that's what we have. So thank you again for being with us. God bless you. God bless you, Richard. Always great yeah, to be God with you. you. See you guys. <laughs> Bye-bye.